Okay, recalling that we start with this variational problem. We have changes in velocity we want to figure out, and we also may have changes in strain we want to understand. So, again, these are independent variables. We have variations in each one. We want to break this problem down and first look at this, see if we can simplify this down, and then we'll do the same here. And then in the end, we'll combine these again and we'll show that this leads to Newton's law of balance of forces with mass times acceleration. So first, this integral. So I've brought it down here. And what we're doing is applying the same identity, integral identity. We have <coughs> this variation term. And then over here, we're subtracting this term. So if we scroll, if we scroll back up, so recall up here, this is where I'm getting this. This is that um, ex first example we did. We're taking a time derivative. We've started here and we broke out the derivatives on each component inside here. And then we had this on our boundaries. And we said, by definition, we don't have variations on the boundary. We know what that is. So this will be zero. So we now we have this integral equal to the negative of this integral. This one's going to be important in a moment. I'll show you why. But first, let's, let's come to the second one. So remember, we have this second relation based on strain, which I've written as uh, displacement gradient. So I have it written here. And there's one thing I do with this first. So it doesn't matter if we take the gradient first and then the variation versus take the variation in displacement and then the gradient. So those can be taken either way, same ultimate result. So given this form, <clears throat> we're going to apply the, the same um, <clears throat> integral identity product rule. We can go from here. We'll get this on our boundary. All right. And we're going to get this other integral over the, um, over the length of the rod. So to remind you about that, this is what we're doing. So remember this form here, we've, let me go even further back. So we have this relation, we divided up the volume integrals and we separate them out like this. You can do that in 1D like this and you have this term. So if I come back to here, so this would be like that U term, and this would be the delta V that I had previously. So we just divide that into the boundary term and the integral term. And we're just carrying around this integral over time. So that just um, follows through. Same thing applies here. We say that we know the displacement's on the boundary, so it's going to be zero there. So this whole thing will be zero. So we're just left with this. So in the end, here's what we have. So there's something important through this process. You notice we have this variation in A out here. So we did this specifically to get this separate from the other gradients. If I go back to here, you notice I also have this common term outside of the time derivatives. So when we combine this, we sum up these, and you notice they're both negative, so we've got carry my negative through. And I'm just saying this is what we started with, so the whole thing has to be zero. The other thing important that we do is we assume that this integrand is applicable for any delta t and for any interior points 
um, between 0 and L. If that's true, then the whole integrand has to be 0. Second important thing, remember we're taking guesses. So this delta A can be arbitrarily anything, preferably not 0, so we can divide it out. So we just divide this out and we say that for any non-zero delta variation in A, this has to be zero. Right? So this is going to turn into our Newton law equation. So remember from before, our Lagrangian density was kinetic energy minus stored energy. Kinetic energy depends on velocity. Stored energy depends on strain. So if I now substitute that into here when I take the derivatives on the velocity it only depends on this if I took derivatives velocity here this is always zero so I just have kinetic energy carrying down my time derivative and then my spatial derivative it's only on you there's no strain over here so this gets us a little closer to Newton's law. Finally, we explicitly take that time derivative on kinetic energy. So we get this. So if you go back in the notes, here's what we had um, starting with the kinetic energy. And I just write it here, two double dots is acceleration. <clears throat> derivative on my strain energy it's going to be the modulus times the strain. That's equivalent to a measure of stress. So ultimately, here is Newton's law. So this is saying that my inertial forces on the left-hand side have to balance with a change in stress. So if you have a imbalance of stresses in your system, then that that body is going to start moving. So imagine if you had a block with more forces on the left hand side than on the right, that imbalance of force will create motion. And that completes it. So this is an equation you probably very well know, but what we've done is I want to show you you can get this from energy methods. So then if you pose the problem in terms of an energy you can start creating hypothesis based on certain material properties to identify what can we better understand about the material based on these governing laws starting with an energy principle. Later we'll talk about how you can do the same thing from a force balance. Um, that works great in mechanics. Sometimes it's not intuitive when you're dealing with electromagnetics. So we'll, we'll talk about the differences there when one approach is advantageous over another.